Now moving on to a specific term called ptosis. This is basically just a lazy eye, a drooping eyelid. We have an abnormality in terms of drooping of that eyelid over the pupil. Now it's spelled ptosis, but to correctly pronounce it, it's just ptosis, like a toe and a sister. Now it's caused by edema or impairment of that third cranial nerve. And in older adults, ptosis results from a loss of elasticity as everything becomes dried and basically crumpled up, right? That really accompanies with aging. And it can also be seen with facial paralysis like in myasthenias gravis. Now the next key term is cataracts. So cataracts is cloudy and even blurry central vision. So you have a good memory trick for this, right? I do. Okay. So one way to remember, because I oftentimes I would get confused between cataracts and glaucoma. So I always think cats are furry. Okay. And so cataracts are blurry. Oh, wow. I like that. So cataracts are essentially blurry or cloudy central vision. Now, what about glaucoma? So glaucoma, so I always think about, uh, so glaucoma is essentially when you have that increased intraocular pressure that causes that tunneling of the vision. So I always think about the tunnel vision because you lose the peripheral vision. And when you lose that peripheral vision, you get the tunnel vision, and so often called tunnel vision. I think about when someone's in a coma, they say, don't go to the light at the end of the tunnel. Oh. So glaucoma, Man, that's coma, okay. tunnel vision, don't go to the light at the end of the tunnel. That makes a lot of sense. Okay, glaucoma. Is someone with tunnel vision. Tunnel vision. And from all that fluid buildup inside that eyeball. Yeah. Yes, that increased intraocular pressure. So essentially what we do is we, because they start to lose that peripheral vision, mm -hmm. you give them eye drops to reduce the pressure inside the eye, and it reduces the pressure. Now, it doesn't fix any of the vision that was already lost, but it will prevent them from going blind. Oh, okay. Because if you don't fix the problem, it will just keep going in and in until they can't see anymore. Oh, wow. So important adherence of medication with glaucoma. Yes. And now for a practice question. A nurse is assessing a client who was involved in a motor vehicle crash. Which of the following techniques should the nurse use to test corneal reflexes? Lightly touch the eye with a wisp of cotton. Not exam the eye using a pen light. Remember, don't get tricked here. That would be either pupillary light or corneal light test. So if the test does not have the word light in it, then don't use a light. So just remember, don't get mixed up. Okay, now moving on to infants. Remember, infants have these really short eustachian tubes inside their ear, a lot shorter than adults. So this leads to more ear infections, like my brother, he just had a little baby, and this little baby just always gets ear infections because those little tubes are so short. So those eustachian tubes are set in place because it drains pathogens into the nasopharynx and helps get things out of the ear and out to the rest of the body, sucking through the lymph and just exposed up. So if those little eustachian tubes get infected, this causes otitis media, fancy words for ear infection. Now it's very common in infants, as said before, because those little eustachian tubes. So just like your brother, many might say, oh, I had ear infections, or sorry, your brother's child will just grow out of ear infections. Right. Or they'll say, I got them a lot, but then I just grew out of them. And that's kind of true because once your ear canal grows and it gets that more of that adult shape, mm -hmm. then it's less common to get ear infections. Yeah, it just doesn't get plugged up as much, right? Absolutely. Hey there, nursing student. Listen up. Did you know only 20% of our videos are here on YouTube? You're missing out on over 900 videos not on YouTube, plus 500 visual study guides that follow along every video, and a massive quiz bank to test your knowledge. All neatly organized in our new app. Try it for free. Visit simplenursing.com today. Other risk factors for acute otitis media, because this is commonly tested on, are things like preterm babies because all babies are born not fully developed, but preterm babies are even less developed. Oh man. So increased risk of ear infections, secondhand smoke exposure, uh, also pacifier use, daycare attendance, uh, seasons, so sometimes like fall and winter are gonna be increased risk. Mm -hmm. And then also propping a baby up with a bottle at night, you know, while they're laying down and potentially falling asleep and whatnot, that can increase the risk of ear infections. Very interesting. I think because of that sucking motion, right, with the pacifier effect too. Mm -hmm. Now for older adults, remember everything slows down and stiffens up, basically atrophies. So aging persons or our elderly population, remember the cilia that line the ears as well as the lungs, right? So this becomes coarse and stiff. 
and those little hairs inside the ears help move wax out to the external auditory, or basically outside that little ear canal. So with the hairs, they get stiff and earwax gets stuck, and now infection can settle in. Now, as this earwax gets stuck, it often leads to hearing loss, but we can just flush the ear out all the time and it's reversible. Now, presbycusis is gradual loss or gradual hearing loss that occurs with aging. So what do we have to know about that? So one thing to know here is presby, that root word means common related to aging. Okay. So presbyopia means age related losses of vision. So presbycusis is age related losses in hearing. So with that, it's slowly over time. So it's sensory neural loss, so it happens over a longer period of time. So very different if you're worried, okay, do, does this patient potentially have impacted cerumen mm -hmm. or presbycusis? Well, impacted cerumen is usually sudden. It's mm -hmm. going to be because it's air conductive loss. So it's like they were cleaning their ear out with the Q-tip and all of a sudden they can't hear anymore because they jammed that cerumen in there. Oh, all that earwax just packed it up. Yes. Okay. And so, but then presbycusis is going to happen more slowly over time. And the biggest thing is they lose that high pitch tones first. Oh. So lots of times they'll say that, you know, they can't hear their wife talk. She has a higher pitch voice. Mm -hmm. A patient might say that. Or one big thing is if your patient has loss of hearing, don't raise your voice and yell louder to them because ah. it actually doesn't increase the chance that they can hear you. It makes it harder because of that pitch, that volume. Ah, very interesting. They also lose the ability to localize sound. So sound is like difficult to localize. So important to turn off TVs, remove background noise. Otherwise, it's going to be harder for them to hear when you're speaking to them. So when you're doing ear assessment, if you work on a specialty unit, you can, uh, or sometimes it's done like in a clinic setting, you can use an otoscope to look in the ear and look at the tympanic membrane. So what's commonly tested on or can be tested on is what the tympanic membrane should look like if you're looking inside the ear. Now, like we talked about earlier today, when you uh, are looking in the ear, if it's an adult, you will pull up and back. If it's a child, you will pull straight down. You do the same thing when you're using an otoscope to look at the tympanic membrane. But either way, and this is commonly asked about, is what should the tympanic membrane look like? And the tympanic membrane just that uh, eardrum, correct? The eardrum, yeah, fancy okay. name for an eardrum. And so when you're looking down, it should be gray, glossy, smooth and intact and concave. So caved away from you. Okay. And then there's a cone of light at either five o'clock or seven o'clock. And so this kind of reminds me of your seven. Yes, the L7 loser. Because <laughs> also how to know which ear you're looking at. If, it's, if the cone of light or a little light shining from that otoscope, if it's at five o'clock, you're in the right ear. Mm -hmm. But if it's at seven o'clock, you're in the left ear. Because oh. seven okay. can also, seven can translate to, can be flipped over to an L. So I think L for left and seven. And so if it's at seven o'clock, it's the left ear. Okay. So if you were looking down the ear of someone with acute otitis media, which again is our fancy name for ear infection, it won't be gray, glossy, smooth, and intact. Instead, it'll be red, convex, coming kind of bulging at you. And that cone of light's gonna be displaced. It won't be at five o'clock or seven o'clock. It can even be in multiple spots oh, or man. can cover a whole time range. Okay, so obviously the red and irritated is obviously an indication of possible infection. Absolutely. Okay, now let's talk about perforated tympanic membrane, also called a ruptured eardrum. This commonly occurs with acute otitis media if it's not treated. Just think about all that pressure of infection just getting built up in that ear canal and just busting out in the eardrum. We're talking a rupture from that increased pressure. So this can also occur from trauma like getting slapped or even hit in the ear. And a client will report sudden pain relief, especially when they have too much pressure from let's say an infection. So a big NCLEX tip here. Typically with a perforation or even a rupture of that tympanic membrane, think about clients with appendicitis who have a lot of pressure, right? And even any type of pressure. So any relief or sudden pain relief is typically not a good thing. Remember NCLEX and even your nursing exams, they're not gonna suddenly cure your client. So if something suddenly happens that is good or pain relief, it typically means a bad thing. Now another thing we can use is tamponostomy tubes, which also called is a T-tube. My brother actually had these. Oh yeah. So, but he actually had these when he was in his mid thirties. 
Oh, wow. So he was a firefighter in Los Angeles, let infection from COVID go too long, didn't really take care of himself. Oh. And apparently he had really bad ear infection that left untreated. And so all that pressure just really built up and he had to get these T tubes inside of his ear to really drain all that pressure as well as the fluid infection. So interesting. First responders often good at taking care of other people, yeah. bad at taking care of ourselves. Horrible, <laughs> yeah. But these are really uh, for, you know, babies and little kids in the pediatric area who get tons of ear infections. So remember, these tiny straws allow fluid to drain freely rather than fluid and infection to build up behind that eardrum or tympanic membrane. So it just allows for consistent drainage from any pressure being built up. Okay, now let's move on to hearing tests. This is cranial nerve number eight. Yes, so we have our different pathways of hearing. We have air conduction, which is your normal hearing pathway, mm -hmm. how you're hearing me right now. Uh, basically, when I'm speaking, the air is traveling through the air, going down that ear canal, vibrating the tympanic membrane, then vibrating the mouse, the incus, and the stapes, and then going in through that round window for your brain to interpret and whatnot. Oh my um, gosh. And then you realize what's being said. So that's that normal hearing pathway. Bone conduction is that alternate route. It's going to be that sensory neural pathway. Hmm. Uh, but both are really needed for cranial nerve eight. Okay. And so we have some of our air conduction versus bone conduction hearing tests to see what type of loss is happening. So if someone loses their hearing, if it's air conductive loss, or sometimes they call that AC, air conduction hearing loss, mm -hmm. usually it's something that happens suddenly. Or they say they could hear just fine a, a second ago or a day ago, and then now they can't. So it could be like earwax impaction, mm. or if you put something in your ear, like if you plug your ears and now you can't hear me, mm -hmm. and then you can, that's air conduction loss. What about bugs? Oh, if you've got like a cockroach, if it crawled in your ear and then you couldn't hear, then that could cause air conductive hearing loss. That actually happens a lot. I had that happen a few times in the ER when I used to work there. That's terrifying. And, and, <laughs> and it was nasty because this, this, this client comes in and they're like, I can feel fluttering of the wings inside my eardrum. And I'm like, oh. Oh, goodness. And I had to be the one to actually help pull it out, so it was pretty nasty. Anyways, back to the show. <laughs> <laughs> so oftentimes, key phrase you'll see with air conductive loss, patients will say, or in the question, they'll say, I could hear three days ago. So again, suddenly. So if someone has otitis media, and that tympanic membrane is swollen, and then it ruptures, hmm. and it, so then it doesn't vibrate. They have the air conduction or conductive hearing loss. Sensory neural loss, though, that bone conduction pathway, that tends to be something more in that middle or inner, inner ear. So that's like someone who is born deaf or has, you need know, to get a cochlear implant, or someone who loses it slowly over time, like older adults, or sometimes someone who has repeated exposure to environmental noise and sound that can cause hearing damage over time. Other causes could be things like measles, syphilis, certain medications you want to give slowly because it can cause um, otosclerosis and whatnot and can oh, cause yeah. sensory neural loss. Okay, so next we're gonna talk about a few different hearing tests for cranial nerve eight. We have some that involve a tuning fork and we have one that doesn't. So one that does not involve a tuning fork is the whisper test. So with the whisper test, you're gonna stand about arm's length behind the patient. And you're gonna have the patient cover up one ear. So go ahead and cover up one ear or occlude one ear. And I'm gonna whisper two words, simple nursing. <laughs> Home warranty. Can you tell me what two words I whispered? Simple nursing. Very good. And then you would have them do the other side and repeat those two words, and, or and do two different words. And if they can repeat both of those words back to you and they hear both of those they, from both ears, then you would say, report whispered words are heard bilaterally. And then the sensory component of cranial nerve eight is intact. Mm. So that's the whisper test. And again, you want to do different phrases each time because otherwise, then they'll know which words you're saying. Yeah, they'll catch on. Now, how about the tuning fork test? That's a great question. So with the tuning fork tests, there are two different ones. And oftentimes we measure that ability to hear air conduction or via by bone conduction. So we use the vibration of the sound because that can conduct through the cranial bones to the inner ear. Remember the air conductive route, that's the normal pathway. And so that's when it goes through the ear canal, uh, down that ear canal and vibrates that tympanic membrane. So the first one is the Weber test. So with the tuning fork, you would hit the tuning fork and you're gonna place it for the Weber test in the middle of the client's head. 
and you're going to ask them, can you hear the sound equally in both ears? Oh, wow. Can you hear this equally in both ears? Mm -hmm. Fantastic. So that is actually a normal finding. The fact that he could hear the sound equally in both ears means that cranial nerve 8 is intact. If he could only hear it one ear or the other one better, even though it's in the middle and it's vibrating, then that would indicate there's either a sensory neural or a conductive hearing loss. You would typically have to do further tests to figure out which one because you'd have to know which ear was injured right. and which one it lateralized to. Mm -hmm. um, but important to note is just that normal finding would be if they say, yes, they can hear equally in both ears. Abnormal would be if it lateralizes to one ear. So now we have the Rennie test, or some people call it the Rhine test. I kind of purposely mispronounce it for Rennie because I think of the two N's in the word Rennie. Uh, it's either R-I-N-N-E, or I've also seen it spelled R-H-I-N-N-E. The important thing is two N's always exist. So that is because there are two parts to this test. So I'm going to hit the tuning fork. The first part, I'm gonna place it on the mastoid process, the bone, and I'm gonna watch a clock. I'm going to patient, tell me when the vibration, tell me when the sound stops. No. And then you're going to, without hitting it again, move it into the ear and they'll hear it again. Uh. And then tell me when it stops. No. Very good. So with this, you are testing bone conduction. You place it on the bone, the mastoid process. And it seems as though the sound has stopped, but it's only stopped via that bone conductive process. You move it in front of the ear in the air and you're testing now air conduction mm. and it's continuing. That's because it will continue via that normal hearing pathway. So expected is that air conduction is two times longer than bone conduction. So lots of times they'll say A is two, AC is two times longer than BC, air conduction two times longer than bone conduction. So it was five seconds here then when I moved it in front of and it held it in the air, it was another five seconds, which is 10 seconds total. Because he was always hearing the air conduction the first way. So that would be a normal finding.